Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about epilepsy, sleep, and epilepsy networks and how they all interrelate. So in terms of our basic understanding and relationship between sleep and epilepsy, we know that sleep deprivation and the state of being asleep can be potent activators of epilepsy. And we know and uh, frequently perform um, sleep deprived studies in neurophysiology labs because they are so useful and we know we can increase our diagnostic yield from a routine awake study which may be something in the region of about 20 to 25 percent to up to 40 percent using sleep deprivation techniques. Now we know historically over many centuries if not millennia that sleep deprivation can actually enhance epilepsy and in previous videos, um, I've talked about uh, luminosity of the moon. You can click on the iCard above to see more about that. But also, I've also described in some of the other videos um, how sleep enhances discharges, particularly for Rolandic epilepsy, or childhood epilepsy with central temporal spikes, and also in the genetic generalized epilepsies um, as well. And you can click on the iCards above for all of that as well. But it's most striking in a scenario called ESUS, Electrical Status Epilepticus in Sleep, and I'm going to be showing you some examples of this. On the whole, we know that most um, epilepsy promoting periods of sleep are around transition zones, particularly around uh, light sleep. Um, that's so that's going into sleep or coming out of sleep. And that's particularly the case for the genetic generalized epilepsies or in the old currency primary generalized epilepsies as they used to be known. Um, now, in the previous couple of videos, um, I spent some time, number one, describing uh, normal um, alpha activity and B, um, sleep and what happens with the EG during that. And those would be really useful videos for you to have a look at. So, for example, if we have a genetic generalized um, epilepsy, so this um, example uh, shows an EEG, um, red is for the right, blue is for the left, and we're looking at the frontotemporal chains on the top and the centroparietals and the central ones down below in the orange. And you can see over here um, that they are awake. You can see these um, eye movements over here and they close their eyes over there and you can see this beautiful alpha rhythm, which uh, then continues. They then become drowsy, and as they become drowsy, the theta activity enhances, that's 4 to 7 hertz activity, and wham, all of a sudden you start seeing these large amplitude polyspike slow wave discharges, um, which are generalized and are occurring here within this drowsy state. As um, sleep deepens, then the density of those particular discharges decreases. You can see over here, there are just a couple of them now. And as they move into uh, slow wave sleep over here, they have virtually disappeared, although occasional fragmented uh, polyspikes anteriorly persist. And then following arousal, one can see re-emergence of these spike slow wave discharges. So that's an, a lovely example of how the transition into sleep and the transition out of sleep can be quite potent activators. Here's a different example. Uh, this is a uh, person with a benign Rolandic epilepsy or childhood epilepsy with central temporal spikes, um, which you can see over here. And as they uh, actually fall asleep, they become far more abundant. And as is typical actually uh, for these type of conditions, the more abundant the discharge is, the more sleep architecture is disrupted and it becomes much harder to see uh, what sleep stage someone is in. This is quite a remarkable example of Landau-Kleffner syndrome or acquired aphasia. And in this example, you can see ESUS, electrical status epilepticus in sleep, and you can see these abundant discharges occurring throughout. And I've, I've actually changed the tie base here so you can see a, a far broader uh, period of time. And what's most striking here is that when they awaken, all of that discharge activity just melts away. 
Now, what can be really fascinating to see from time to time for us is that when one is seeing uh, sleep architecture within stage two sleep around the vertex waves, one can every so often find an epilepsy which has these little spikes which are timed with the vertex wave. So here you can see these little uh, spike slow waves which are coming in with the vertex wave and you can see it again over here um, around the vertex and over there over there and over there here's a, a different example um, so instead of little small spikes like that you can see um, this is a uh, stage two sleep you can see sleep spindles over here and you can see a k complex over there with the vertex with the spindle activity and then every so often you will start seeing these spike slow waves poly spikes um, with the vertex and again another example so another epoch there with um, a standard vertex wave uh, with spindle so a k complex um, and then over here very clearly uh, a spike slow wave um, occurring where that vertex um, k complex would have been so networks now Networks may either be structural or they may be functional, and we know that some epilepsies are able to establish their own networks. And we also know that some epilepsies can hijack existing networks, and I've just shown you a couple of examples of how some epilepsies can actually take over those vertex discharges of what would normally be regular sleep architecture. So there is increasing evidence in general that epileptic mechanisms can actually take over existing sleep related networks. But it's only every so often that we can actually be able to appreciate um, those discharges over um, sleep architecture. So going into the future, there are better techniques to identify how networks and epilepsy occur and how epileptic networks form. We have QEEG, where we can have a look quantitatively at the different frequencies and look at coherence. So that's how one area of the brain, whether it's in synchrony with another area of the brain, we can use MEG, where we're using magnetic techniques to look at currents around the brain. And we can use more advanced imaging, functional MRI, FDG PET, tractography, for example. And the importance of this is primarily to better understand epilepsy, but can be quite important in theory to understand prognosis, particularly those who are undergoing surgery, where we know that some who will be having surgery may not have a good as outcome as we would like, particularly if the um, region which is being taken away um, may already um, not be sufficient because some of that um, propensity to have seizures um, has moved elsewhere via networks and it may also change how we eventually treat epilepsy too particularly if it is medication resistant so as always thank you for watching i hope it's been interesting please do support the channel by hitting the subscribe button and the like and uh, hopefully seeing you in the next video at some point in the near future all the very best